Emeritus at Chicago State University, and he's the founder of Third World Press, the nation's oldest publisher of black thought and literature. And I should say that I always call him Big Brother because uh, he was born in February of the same year that I was born in August. So he, he, he has me a few months. And, I, and I've always uh, loved and respected him. And he's always been a great uh, mentor to me. Uh, he has an incredible history. And I, I know sometimes people say you don't say everything about a person. But, but I think you should know, just have some general idea of who this man is. Uh, we, we can talk about his many books and so on, and we will say something about them. But uh, when he was a child, he actually moved to Detroit, uh, and uh, he had been born in Little Rock. And his mother worked in various jobs to support her family and became addicted to drugs and, and alcohol, uh, dying uh, when he was uh, only 16 years of age. And he went and served in the Army, the United States Army. He received his MFA from the University of Iowa in 1984. And he changed his name uh, to Hakim Adabudi in 1973. So you have some general idea who this man is. He, he is, in many ways, in the tradition of the greatest of our writers. Uh, if you start uh, wherever you start, I mean, uh, if you start with Richard Wright, um, uh, you start with Dunbar, wh wherever you want to go, with um, uh, Phyllis Wheatley, <laughs> you can go all the way back to Phyllis Wheatley. He's in, he's in the tradition of the African people who have always spoken their own words in their own time, in their own place. Uh, uh, Dr. Matabuti became interested in influence uh, by the Black Arts Movement. He read such figures as Richard Wright, and certainly Ellison in his early age. And uh, I think his mother's life had a great impact on him, particularly seeing her struggle to raise her children. And uh, he credits her as a wellspring of his intellectual development. He wrote a book, Yellow Black, a few years ago, uh, sort of a memoir of his growing up, which is very, very powerful. But he, he's published, uh, his first collection, Think Black, in 1967, uh, followed by Black Pride in 1968, Don't Cry in 1969, We Walked the Way of the New World, 1970, and Book of Life in 1973. I told people the other day, before there was Tupac, there was Haki. And in fact, not only that, but uh, Tupac learned from people like Haki. And his work has always dealt with issues of racism, violence, stigmatization, and the oppression of black people. And he's also been a very great champion of women. In fact, his latest book is called Taught by Women. And, uh, and, I, and I find that really powerful. Uh, I remember, and I've told this story, he's heard me tell this story before maybe, but I remember, and uh, must have been in the late 60s, I was driving um, Gwendolyn Brooks to the airport in Los Angeles. I was a student at UCLA and, um, and I was asking her to tell me about the Harlem Renaissance and she says, no, you don't need to hear about the Harlem Renaissance. He said that was a bunch of black writers uh, going to the parlors of white people reading their poetry to white people. So what you want to hear, you know, is at that time she told me, you want to hear Don Lee, <laughs> you know, you want to hear Haki Madhubuti. She says, that's what's happening now. Young man, you, you need to know what's going on. And uh, I later came to discover that she had a profound impact on him. Uh, he's not only a prolific writer uh, and builder of institutions, but his famous work, and one that Jasmine Evans, and I really appreciate Jasmine Evans, uh, for our technical support here today, and also Belinda Wilson, our administrator. But Jasmine said to me, wow, the book that's in my library is uh, Black Men, Obsolete, Single, Dangerous, and so on, The African-American Family in Transition. I mean, he, this man has written on every possible subject that concerns us. And that is an incredible thing. And his mentor, uh, uh, in, in many ways, Gwendolyn Brooks, respected him so highly, and he respected her. In fact, he created 
uh, the Gwendolyn Brooks Center for Black Literature and Creative Writing, uh, and was the founder and the director of that program uh, while he was at Chicago State. He's, he's um, uh, actually a professor emeritus at that university, and he has taught in many places, given lectures all over the place. And, uh, you know, I've met him in Africa, met him here, and uh, he uh, lives with his very uh, prominent and also uh, intellectual wife, Safisha, who's a professor at Northwestern University. At this time, I'm going to ask Haki if he would come forward and just go ahead and talk to us for the next 40 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Asante. Um, I'm really happy to be here uh, with you all for a number of reasons. Uh, one, I have so many extended family in uh, Philadelphia. Uh, I can't come there without seeing Dr. Diane Turner, uh, Professor Sonia Sanchez and Dr. Mark Lamont Hill and my very good friends, uh, Beverly Lomax and Sarah Lomax uh, and Dr. Regina Jennings and, and, and Dr. Boxton and others. But most certainly Dr. Malefe Kete Asante. I am so um, proud of him, I don't know what to do. Anytime you create an institute uh, and you begin to understand the world at a different level, there's nothing like having to make a payroll every two weeks. <laughs> that You will grow up rather quickly <laughs> because you can't pay somebody with an essay or with a poem. <laughs> you got to pay people real money, right? That's right? And keeping a facility, we own a half a block in Chicago and where we have uh, three institutions, four, actually four, actually, the New Concept School, which is our preschool, the Betty Shabazz Academy, and the Barbara Ann Sizemore uh, Academy, K-8, both K-8, Third World Press, Third World Press Foundation. So we are in the process of not only working at these academic institutions, which we have to do in terms of making a living, but taking our resources and putting them back into the community and developing these institutional structures that will live far beyond us. Third World Press is 53 years old, which is the largest independent black book publishing company in the world. And we have our own headquarters. Okay? But beyond that, it's important for us to understand <laughs> that we're here for a reason. We're not just here to stake up, take up space. We're here to essentially represent. And when uh, Dr. Asante called me, I quickly said yes, primarily because I turned 79 this week on the 23rd of February, on the same day as the great W.B. Du Bois. We were born on the same day. If he was still alive in flesh, he's still alive in our hearts, he would be what, 100 and what, 58? 53. And, but I read Du Bois early in life, along with uh, Richard Wright, and Margaret Walker, and others. And I'm going to talk about, briefly for these 45 minutes or so, about this struggle that we've been a part of. And I would hope that the questions will come from okay. what, what I'm saying, because essentially, I think that much of what I will share with you this evening is not widely known. We came into this struggle to change the conversation. We arrived not only as very young represent representatives of the, next, of the fire next time, as Baldwin would say, but as three-dimensional when gaining hurricane strength Attacking America. Well, it should be your last email to come in. White supremacy. As manifested in the politics, economics, education, military, history, psychology, literature, entertainment, healthcare, urban and rural policies of Western culture. No small task for poets and artists, writers and scholars. However, we were as serious as a first love and had excellent teachers and examples. The poets 
of the Black Arts Movement, BAM, stood on the shoulders of those great writers and poets and musicians and visual artists and historians who preceded us. Unlike the Harlem Renaissance, BAM was truly, truly a grassroots national movement that developed international Pan-African roots and participation. Our work, our production, our artistic reality cannot be separated from the day-to-day -day struggles of Black people. People of African ancestry across this country are in the blooming consciousness of the Black diaspora. The young poets and other artists had grown weary of many of their elders who often were satisfied with the status quo. We had attracted ourselves and attached ourselves to the different set of wise men and women. Our political, artistic, and literary voices were being shaped by W.B. Du Bois, Langston Hughes, Marcus Garvey, Louis Armstrong, Carter G. Woodson, Claude McKay, Jean Toomer, Elaine Locke, Charlie Parker, Willina Brooks, Zoe Neale Hurston, Catherine Dunham, Margaret Walker, Sterling A. Brown, Robert Hayden, Anna Bontoms, Frank Marshall Davis, Melvin B. Tolson, Amy Gisele, Franz Fanon, John Henry Clark, Duke Ellington, John Coltrane, Kwame Nkrumah, Sequel Touré, Paul Robeson, Chancellor Williams, Arthur B. Davis, Howard Thurman, Darwin T. Thurman, John Oliver Killens, James Baldwin, Vincent Harding, Ron Walters, Eleanor Trailer. Samuel W. Allen, George Kent, Ozzie Davis, Ruby D, and hundreds of others who created and produced the ideas BAM was built upon. Most were race men and women who navigated American apartheid and gave us the flowering ammunition of a new reality and a new revolution. We cease being who happened to be poets or writers or artists or scholars who happened to be black and became as authentic as possible, as possible, growing each millisecond as black poets, writers, scholars, etc. For most of my contemporaries and me, the singular and most muscular voice was Malcolm X, Elijah Malik Al Shabazz, rising out of the nation of Islam under the tutelage of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Malcolm X saw truth beyond the truth always going subsurface to locate the protein of original thought. The work of Malcolm X and his foundation, no efforts in building the nation of Islam, put black on the front burner. He was our bold guide, patient step ladder, and non-contradicting voice who most of us learned to love, trust, and try to emulate. His death in 1965 is often credited and cited as the defining event that sparked the beginning of the Black Arts Movement in this country and internationally. Leroy Jones became a midi Baraka, left the village in New York to move to Harlem and eventually back to Newark, his birth city where his voice was essential and second to none in giving urgency to BAM. He is cited as one of the originators of BAM along with Larry Neal and Oscar Torre, Sonia Sanchez, Gaston Neal, Lucille Clifton, and Jane Cortez. Though they were primarily identified with the East Coast, the activity sparked a simultaneously emergence of BAM across the country. It was national. In the Midwest was Dudley Randall, Margaret Burles, Margaret Dana, Margaret Ev Mar Mary Evans, Ron Milner, Milner Gwendolyn Brooks, Hort W. Fuller, Woody King Jr., Eugene Redmond, myself, I was Don L. Lee at that time, Kellen Rogers, Nikki Giovanni, Sterling Plump, Val Gray Ward, Abana Joan Brown, Jahari Mini, Ethra Knight, and Norman Jordan. In the South, there was Tom Dent, Kalama Yasalan, who was then at the time Val Ferdinand, Margaret Walker, and on the West Coast were Marvin X, Sarah Westford Fabio, Milana Karinga, Ed Bullens, and Joe Concavas. 
This movement included hundreds of others throughout the nation, and most certainly Kerepisi Kosasili, representing the continent of Africa, and early voices like Ed Spriggs, Dave Henderson, Victor Hernandez Cruz, and Ishmael Reed, all credited in groundbreaking service and work in pre-BAM and connecting to other cultures and formations to strengthen BAM. These poets and writers were concerned with producing and defining poems and texts. And as a result of their work, we ceased being Negroes and became black people, people of African ancestry, and finally African-Americans or Africans in America. In 1968, Monica Ringa and Larry Neal produced two insightful essays that provide much of the theoretical basis for BAM. We were young, idealistic, determined, and in turn only felt that we could better the world for the majority rather than for the elite few. Fear for personal safety was never a question as most of us were sincere students of black history thereby always measuring our activities against those of our foreparents. We were rising. We sought fresh air. My eyes have always been those of questioning and skepticism. We define ourselves as the creative forces of the Black empowerment and civil rights movement. Most of us did not totally accept nonviolence, especially since violence was committed against us hourly but we respected its philosophical roots and loved Rosa Parks, and Martin Luther King Jr. and others. For the record, I marched with Dr. King in most of the major demonstrations in Chicago. We too took poetry and theater to the streets. We read on street corners and alleys and bars and taverns and liberation schools. Welfare mothers manned picket lines with the words of Gwendolyn Brooks and Mari Evans. Black students, high school, university, demanded that the black poet's words be included in the ultra white rhetoric and literature courses. That's when black studies began to come off the ground. The works of Dimitri Barak and Sonia Sanchez and Jane Cortez and Henry Dumas actually preceded the black studies programs, which many poets, including myself, were in the vanguard of having to create. Like the music of the Dales and the Marvin Gaye, the Temptations and Curtis Mayfield, the poems of the last poets echo throughout the community. For the first time in recent history throughout the nation, black poetry was being recorded, incorporated in dance and acted to at a mass level. This was the case for the Black House in Los Angeles, to Afro Arts and ETA and Kumbo Theaters in Chicago, to Concept East in Detroit, to New Lafayette and the National Black Theater in Harlem, to Spirit House in Newark, the Free Southern Theater in New Orleans and Caramel uh, uh, House in Cleveland. My first album, Rapping and Reading, was Broadside Press, was recorded at a reading at Wayne State University in 1969. Public readings by many of BAM poets evolved as noticeable competition for the idiot box. The great vine of black vine or the black vine emerged as the prime source of publicity. Black books stores appeared in many of the large black areas and new black publishing houses supplied them with the newest of the new poets books. Black poetry books were coming off the presses and being sold by the thousands weekly. One poet produced books whose sold reached, sales reached the phenomenal number of 100,000 copies. With the demand of black studies, black universities and black thought we found ourselves in the unique position of being able to supply new knowledge that was to become the most explored field in the late 60s and early 70s. The major public houses, which had traditionally overlooked and discouraged Black poets and writers, began to saturate the market with reprints of out of print material while pulling and attracting many of the young Black poets and writers as a little green bait would attract. I had offers from Random House and the University of Illinois. The new black poetry was like the new black music to the white mainstream publishing houses. In effect, not, understand, not understood or taken seriously, but highly profitable. Thus the latter 
part of the 60s and the beginning of the decade of the 70s ushered in the new Black poets as well as Black studies programs across this country. After the assassination of the Prince of Peace, Martin Luther King in 1968, and the explosion of cities around, an explosion of uprising of cities around the country, our work took on a new urgency. We viewed our struggle as a part of the international African liberation movements, the Congress of African People, the US Organization, the Black Panther Party, a serious call for Black theology, the African Center School Movement, Black Power Conferences, and the creation of African Liberation Day, all took up critical space for discussion, evaluation, and of course, action. We must remember that there was also a storm of organizing activity among Black professionals, resulting, resulting in the creation of national Black organizations representing educa educators, psychologists, law enforcement, social workers, doctors, medical care workers, lawyers, politicians, and others. So the BAM poets and activists were a national force pushing hard for self-definition, self-determination, self-reliance, and self-defense. One of the major journals to come out of the 60s and 70s was the Negro Digest Black World magazine under Horton W. Fuller. If the East Coast represented the heart and soul of the Black arts movement, the intellectual center was the Midwest with the indispensable publishing of Negro Digest slash Black World magazine under the extraordinary editorship of W.B. of uh, Horton W. Fuller. Horton W. Fuller. Negro Digest Black World was a monthly magazine of Johnson Publishing Company which also published Ebony and Jet magazines. Even there were, though there were other important journals of BAM such as Soul Book, Freedom Waves, Black Dialogue, The Cricket, The Liberator, The Black Scholar, Amstar One and Two, Black Books of Bulletin, which I edited, The Black Collegiate edited by Kalama Yasalam, The Black Position edited by Gwendolyn Brooks, and the indispensable journal Black Poetry edited by and published by Joe Congalvis. However, it was Negro Digest and Black World Magazine that essentially took up the most space each month, went into battle against white literary establishment while pushing Black mainstream writers, publishing my, Black mainstream writers as well as the new and upcoming poetic voices of BAM. Each year, Hort W. Fuller and his indispensable associate editor, Carol A. Parks, published an annual poetry issue highlighting the original work and senior, of senior Black poets, as well as paying special attention to the new voices, blowing fire, and challenging white and Black mediocrity and betrayal. Much of BAM is documented in the pages of Negro Digest Black World magazine. Each month between 1965 and 1975, Negro Digest Black World published Hort W. Fuller's Perspectives, a column that was the precursor to the internet, email, and Twitter. Hort W. Fuller, a superb editor, cut from the mold of W.E.B. Du Bois, who provided groundbreaking coverage of Black life and liberation struggles as early as the early end of crisis, went into battle. He, du Bo uh, Fuller, went into battle each month, taking on the white literary and political establishments, and seldom, seldom gave quarter to the head Negroes in charge at that time, our white politics or corporate powers. His influence is monumental and will always deserve an honored seat in any discussion of the Black Arts Movement, Black Empowerment Movement, Civil Rights Movement, our struggles nationally and internationally. The DuSable Museum of African American History Broadside Press, Third World Press, Organization of Black American Culture, Obasi, and Lotus Press also came into our vision at that time. The call by many of the Black Arts Movement poets was for institutional development. The first people I met who were serious about such work was Margaret and Charlie Burroughs. And this was in 1962. They and others founded the Chicago and Chicago, Illinois, the Ebony Museum of Negro History. In their home, it was, a, it was the first black museum of its kind in the nation. 
and eventually changed his name to the DuSable Museum of African American History. And there's a whole history around that I'm not gonna go into. And moved to much more substantial and spacious headquarters in a park on the South Side of Chicago. The Saba Museum, under the capable direction of Dr. Margaret Burroughs, who was a writer and world-class visual artist, went on to impact the National Black Museum movement in the nation. And as you know, there are close to 100 or more Black museums in the country. I joined them as a volunteer in 1962 while still serving in the United States Army. I was stationed at Fort Sheridan, Illinois, about to go mad as I secretly wrote poetry read books and talk to myself. Meeting Margaret and Charlie Burroughs was black salvation. I volunteered on evenings and weekends, and this allowed me to literally devour their substantial library, especially Marxist literature, which I read under the careful guidance of Charlie Burroughs, who had been raised partially in the USSR and spoke Russian fluently. Between 1962 and 1966, I did everything asked of me mop floors, empty garbage cans, lecture on current exhibits, and eventually worked my way up to assistant curator. The museum was a destination for national and international visitors. Guests from USSR, Europe, Africa, the Caribbean, and elsewhere visited the museum. I remember meeting Alex Haley as he was writing Roots in the autobiography of Malcolm X. At the assassination of Malcolm X in 1965, Margaret Burroughs had a visitor from Detroit. He was Dudley Randall, a poet of considerable stature and founder of Broadside Press, which at that time published poetry on sheets. But Mr. Randall soon realized that he had to move to books to accommodate the growing number of black poets who had no formal outlet before Broadside Press. He come to Chicago basically to consult with Margaret Burroughs to see if she would assist him in uh, pulling together an anthology dedicated to the life and death of Malcolm X, which became for Malcolm poems of the life and death of Malcolm X. And was for, to, for many of us and to the world, the first book dedicated to the enormous contributions of our leader. However, it remained the first and only poetry anthology to be published on his life and its historical value is greatly heightened because it introduced a large number of black poets and others to the national audience who became serious contributors to BAM. Uh, in that book, we had Clarence Majors, Etheridge Knight, Ted mm -hmm. Jones, Conrad Kent Rivers, Julia Fields, Bob Hamilton, David Henderson, Get a Piece of Costa Sealy, Raymond Patterson, Zach Gilbert, Sonia Sanchez, Edward Spriggs, and Oliver Legrand. Broadside Press was and remains the most important black poetry book publisher to come out of BAM, to come out of the 60s. Close on the heels of Broadside Press was Lotus Press, 1972, also of Detroit, Michigan, published and edited by the extraordinary poet Nomi Long Magic, whom we lost about four or five weeks ago, maybe a little bit longer, but she just passed. Which is, you know, the, 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 the publishing company is still in existence and Lotus Press and Broadside Press have joined to become a singular press itself. But Lotus Press published certain people other than uh, Nomi Long Magic, Mae Miller, Lance Jeffers, Kari T.H. Chetwood, Toy Donnecat, James A. Emanuel, Houston Baker, to name a few. I was always aware of the limitations of language and understood that direct action is one in one's community the building of institutions and the creation of programs that spoke directly to the need and, and, and of our people was very serious in, in doubt in terms of coming out of other institutions. So we had to kind of redefine all this for ourselves. I learned this from the black church. Third World Press, 1967, which I founded in my basement apartment about the size of a large conference table which I share with the other unwanted animals. Uh, <laughs> I called Jahari Meany and Jahari, uh, who was Jewel Little at Lattimore at that time and Carolyn Rogers to meet with me and, and come in and try to help build their world press, which they did. Uh, Carolyn Rogers stayed about three, three to six months. Uh, uh, Jahari Meany stayed for about 
five to 10 years off and on as she went to chiropractic school. So broad, you know, Third World Press was founded in my basement apartment in 1967. And so for, we have been publishing for over 53 years now, and we continue to publish. And now in all genres, you know, not only is it poetry, but also history, politics, it doesn't matter, we, just, we, we publish. And, 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 and we published the first black writer to win the Pulitzer Prize, Gwendolyn Brooks, she's one of our major authors. Published Emilia Baraka, Sonia Sanchez, Skidia Touré, Sterling Plum, Get a Piece of Costa Sicily. Uh, and Costa Sicily, who died a few years back, was the first uh, poor lawyer of South Africa. Uh, Norman uh, Jordan, uh, Phil Roster, Kalama Yassalam, Dudley Randall. Gil Scott Hand, we published Gil Scott Hand's first book of poetry. He had published a couple of books, uh, uh, novels prior to the poetry. Fred Lee Horde. Angela Jackson, who just became the uh, poet lawyer of the state of Illinois, and and there goes to see the house and others. Also, what was happening nationally was the organization of Black American culture in Chicago, and the Writers Workshop, which was led by the indispensable Hort W. Fuller. The Chicago-based Writers Workshop uh, that, that, that he mentored encouraged us to 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 write and publish, and out of that came No More and so forth. But I have not really spoken of Gwendolyn Brooks, who soundly grounded to her family, her people, and to her writing, the whole understanding of we have not only a past, a present, but we have a future. There was little ambiguity in Ms. Brooks' makeup. When I met her in 1967, she was teaching poetry writing to members of the Blackstone Rangers. And I was truly amazed at this Pulitzer Prize winner, soon to be poor lawyer to the state of Illinois and the consultant in the poetry at the Library of Congress, which is now the National Poor Lord, mix it up with young teenagers from the unforgiving streets of the South Side of Chicago. She was working with the great, great poet, musician, entertainer, Oscar Brown Jr. In fact, one of the first rappers in the country. She literally gave herself, her resources, her knowledge unconditionally to all who came into her space. That workshop soon moved from the Southside Church to her home, a very simple wood frame dwelling where we met weekly to grow and practice poetry writing. When I met her, I published my first book, Thank Black, came out in 66, 67. And my second book, Black Pride, was under consideration at Broadside Press. It was eventually be published in 1968 with the introduction by Dilly Randall. But I had published Thank Black through the museum, the Disciple Museum. And I remember coming to meet Gwendolyn Brooks and Thank Black had a white cover with the continent of Africa in the center of the book. And I gave it to her and she looked at the cover for about 10 seconds. Then she put it to her heart and she said, young man, I'm gonna read this tonight, thank you. And then of course, Gwendolyn Brook books became uh, eventually my uh, cultural mother. But she impacted all of us, writers, intellectuals, and as individual rooted in our newfound blackness. She rejected pretentiousness which is characteristic not only of her character, but also of her poetry. When Miss Brooks decided to grow a natural and leave Harper and Row for Broadside Press, she, without knowing it, was setting an example for all of us. She was committed to Black identity and institutional development, and she honored us until her death in 2000. In addition to her multiple volumes of poetry and autobiographies, she published two anthologies highlighting band poets, Jump Bad, a new anthology of Chicago and poetry and, and a broadside treasure. The other person coming out of the Midwest is very important, is Mari Evans, base of operation in Indianapolis, Indiana. Her poetry had been anthologies na anthologized nationally and her first volume of poetry, I'm a Black Woman, remains a classic of BAM. In 1970, the Black Academy of Arts and Letters honored her with this annual poetry prize. An accomplished musician and playwright, 
She has also published children's books and essays and remain one of the most important poets in America. In her work, she always on point, looking for the essential truth about our condition. Dudley Randall, impact on BAM has been documented in Julius E. Thompson's Dudley Randall Broadside Press and the Black Arts Movement in Detroit, 1960-95. His legacy, like that of Brooks and Fuller, will, never, will, will forever be central in the development of the Black Arts Movement. He was the first poet laureate of Detroit, Michigan, and Broadside Press responsible for the being the early publishing houses of Harkeem Anabuti, Don L. Lee, Sonia Sanchez, Nika Giovanni, Ethers Knight, Audrey Lord, Everett Hoagland, and many, many more. He was a poet's poet. The other poet that needs to be really spoken of is Eugene B. Redmond. His participation in BAM as a poet of distinction cannot be overstated. He wears many hats as teacher, scholar, co-founder and publisher of Black River Writers Press and literary ex executor of the estate of the great BAM poet and fiction writer, Henry Dumas. He also edited Drum Voices, the journal that continues to publish BAM poets and others today. He's also a photographer of unusual insight and has documented BAM with his many photog photographs. He is currently the poet laureate of East St. Louis. The Black aesthetic, which is often spoken of, but not given serious credit to where it really belongs, because along with Hort W. Fuller, the most combative and insightful Black critic was Addison Gale Jr. I came out of the work, I came out of the working and non-working poor. I learned the value of education early, especially the value of self-education. In my memoir, which uh, Dr. Asante mentioned earlier, Yellow Black, The First 20 Years of a Poor's Life, came out in 2005, I dwelled deeply into the value of book knowledge, thereby meeting Hort W. Fuller and eventually being mentored by him increased my Black literary knowledge immensely. Fuller knew everybody, and his introduction of Addison Gale Jr. to the old bossy writers encouraged many of us to begin writing literary nonfiction about our art form and others. But between 1965 and 1975, there was a bruising. National battles regarding the literary quality of Black poetry in print and Black poetry on the streets. And so this bitter engagement was not only about the legitimacy of Black writing, but what is known as Black poetry and the Black aesthetic. Poets such as James A. Emanuel, Sarah Westford Fabio, Get a Piece of Coastal Silly, Sterling A. Brown, or many Baraka, Leroy Jones, and others began to essentially let their views be known in these major journals. I'm skipping a little bit because of time, but in 1969, and probably actually in 1968, I started teaching, well, 68, I started teaching at the university level. I started teaching at Columbia College in Chicago. And then the great fiction writer, John Oliver Killens, invited me to this annual writers conference at Fish University in 1968. And I gave a reading and talked about literature and I got two job offers, one for Talladega College and the other to Cornell University. So obviously I wanna to go to Talladega where essentially uh, was a black school. I went to Talladega and gave the same lecture and readings that I gave at Fish University and the white people who actually ran Talladega said, no, we don't want this, we, you're not coming here, no. Then I went to Cornell, it's 1968, and gave the same lecture there. And the student said, yes, we want him. But since I did not have a graduate degree, the faculty at Cornell said, no. We, well, you can come, but we're not gonna credit your course. And of course, I said, I'm not, and I told the students, I'm not coming. Why would I leave Chicago and come to cold ass Ithaca, New York, and teach with these Neanderthals who don't want me there in the first place? This got back to the students. The students, you know, were angry. They went to the English department and laid down the law. I got a call from the 
chairman of the, of the English department, asked me to come back for an interview. I did, and I'm not gonna go into it, but anyway, I put them on notice and embarrassed all of them and got the job. I stayed there for a year, and in that year, as you know, if you look at the literature, the students took over the administration building at Cornell with weapons to bring in the African Studies Department. And of course, the first director of that department was Dr. James Turner, okay? James asked me to stay. I said, no, I'm not staying in this place. I left and went back to Chicago. But prior to going back to Chicago, I traveled to Algiers in North Africa for the Pan-African Festival in 1969. This was my first trip to the continent of my foreparents. At the festival, I met and read poetry on the same stage with Nina Simone, Archie Shep, Ted Jones. Many Black Panther members were seeking asylum and, and refuge in Algiers. The Black Panther visual artist Emery created a poster for the event, which I have here in my home. The band poet Ted, the band poet Ted Jones, who lived in Timbuktu, introduced me to Africa in many ways that were impossible to learn from books, music, or film. We left Algiers and literally walked, took buses and trains into Casablanca, where I flew back to the States to start a new position at Cornell University as his first Black poet in residence. It's 1960, 68, 69, 68, what? So anyway, in 1970, uh, I got a call from, and this is critical, 1970, I got a call from, um, what happened, Don't Cry Scream, my third book was published at, while I was still at Cornell. The book came out, and while at the same time, David Lorenz, who was writing for Ebony Magazine at that time, and Monita Sneet, the Pulitzer Prize winning photographer, followed me around Cornell and then to other areas of the country as I was completing Don't Cry Screen, taking pictures because they're doing an article on me as a first black poet in residence at a Ivy League university. And so in March of 19, 69. The Ebony Magazine came out with the article in it. Don't Cry Scream, my third book came out. And they hit at the same time. And Don't Cry Scream sold more than 75,000 copies in that year. My life was changed. My phone would never stop ringing. So this national presence was a major reason I was asked to join the faculty at Howard University. I'm not going all into that, but I stayed at Howard University for eight years. And between 1970 and 78, I commuted between Chicago and DC every week with the university paying for it. And one of my major influences at Howard was Stephen Henderson, who was the director of the Institute for the, Art, for the Arts and Humanities. And of course, John Killens had joined us from Fish University. Andrew Billingsley was the provost and he was the one who hired me. And while I was there, Stephen Henderson finished this very important groundbreaking study, understanding, the black, understanding new black poetry, black speech and black music as point of reference, which was critical in terms of understanding black poetry. And so, my stand in DC was critical because it was a staging ground that I not only continued to work each week in Chicago, I had to get an apartment in DC, but also using DC and Chicago, I was able to travel around much of the country. I'm one of the few poets who have been able to read in every state in the union of the nation, except South Dakota, North Dakota, Alaska, and Hawaii and been able to essentially travel to four continents, been to Africa about 15 times, met with four presidents, and have been involved in black struggle at so many different levels. Uh, many people do not, do not know this, but the Nation of Islam under the Honorable uh, uh, 
Louis Farrakhan started in my basement, our basement apartment in Chicago. I met Louis Farrakhan in Nigeria at Festac. And where at this time the Nation of Islam was basically uh, breaking up and not knowing where which direction it was going go going in, because the army of Elijah Muhammad had been had died, and so Minister Farrakhan had not decided what he was going to do at that time. I was head of the Festac Arts Group coming from the Midwest, I and Abner John Brown, but I was head of the housing, and so I would be in charge of putting people up there. Got a call from Stevie Wonder. And Stevie Wonder asked if he could come down to the African-American compound. And of course I said, yes. But in Stevie Wonder's entourage was Minister Farrakhan. Okay, that's when I first met him. And about two weeks after he got back to Chicago, uh, got a call from one of his representatives. And he said he wanted to meet with me. And I said, why? He said, well, we want to bring the Nation of Islam back. Well, I said, you can't meet at the Institute of Positive Education on Third World Press because you're all shooting at each other. And I can't bring you here among our babies. We have our children here. So I asked my wife and uh, we were able to meet at our home in Southside Chicago. One thing I'm gonna kind of end this. One thing I did not say and did not really talk about was my wife. We met in the 60s. And we began to date. We dated for about six years because I was, you know, moving back and forth between Chicago and DC. But my wife, uh, Dr. Carol D. Lee, is one of the major scholars in the world. In fact, her book uh, is used in the People's Republic of China. And she has traveled around the world. She was the former president of AERA, which is the American Education Research Association. She was inducted to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She was inducted into the Academy of Education. She is now the president-elect of the Academy of Education. And of course, she uh, retired from uh, emeritus status uh, from uh, Northwestern University. Oh, right. This is very important. I do not have emeritus status at Chicago State University. I, even though I was there 26 years and did so much for the university, but my last year there, I got into a deep fight with the president because they hired a new president who was not qualified. He's black. I've been knowing the guy for about 30 years. I'm not gonna mention his name here, but he was not only, was not only qualified, he was corrupt, you see. And I, I laid it out in a black paper, which I put to the university. And of course, at that point, my position there was pretty much uh, over with. I ended my, um, 42 years in the university system at DePaul University as the last uh, Ida B. Wells Barnett University professor. So I'll just end by stating that I'm leaving out an awful lot. But the point is that all of my adult life, I've been dedicated to and intimately involved in black struggle. All my adult life, this is all I've done. And my wife and I have been together over 50 years. Okay, we have three children, and I had three children before I married. And so again, young people, you must ask yourselves now, why am I here? What am I gonna do while I'm here? Will I make a mark, you see? Why is this education necessary? And you are privileged to be in a city of so many remarkable people, and one of the most remarkable is the founder and director of ecology at Temple University. And understand that Dr. Malefi Asante founded the first PhD in African studies in the world at Temple. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Wonderful. So uh, this was, this was uh, as riveting as I knew it would be and absolutely uh, there was stuff in there that I had never heard <laughs> before, and I learned so much, and I'm sure that the audience did as well. And um, uh, Jasmine, do you have uh, any questions, or how do you want to proceed? Um, right now, there have been no questions asked, so if anyone does have a question for tonight's speaker, please go uh, ahead and submit those. I, 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 would, I would ask a question, because one of the things that 
Um, uh, uh, Dr. Madabuti said, and it's very correct, uh, always, uh, he said, please ask some questions about what I'm, what I'm talking about. And I want to ask a question actually about Hort Fuller. Uh, because Hort Fuller, you, you mentioned Hort Fuller, and a lot of our young people probably don't know this name, which ought to be in every uh, literature class. Um, I, I, I met Hort myself in Dhaka, Senegal, mm. and was extremely impressed, not only with his knowledge, but his commitment uh, to, to our culture. But I never understood where he came from. What, what was his background? How, how did Hoyt get uh, to be the editor of the Black World? Actually, Hoyt did his undergraduate work in Detroit at Wayne State University. Okay. But his family, I believe, came from the South, uh, Atlanta. Because when he retired, when, see, Johnny Johnson fired Hoyt Fuller. He fired him. <laughs> but, but, and I'm, I'm going to get to that in a minute. But the key point is that Hoyt, early on began to develop this deep, deep love for black literature. And he began to, once he finished uh, undergraduate school, he began to travel. He would travel around Africa, travel around mm -hmm. Europe, and begin to meet all these black writers. I met Ayikwe Ama through Hort W. Fuller, and mm -hmm. that's how we ended up published, publishing 2000 Seasons by Ayikwe Ama, okay? Um, I met Chekan Dadia through mm -hmm. Hort Fuller. In fact, I went to Senegal and had dinner with Chick out there Diop and his family in Senegal. And that's when I met the Honorable Leopold Senghor, the president of Senegal. And just, just one sidebar, the president of Senegal asked the African-Americans, I was there in, for a, 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 a convention, an art convention. And he asked the African-Americans to come up and see him at, the, at, the, at, the, at his house, at the, at the palace. Harold Cruz was with us. Mm. Harold, Cruz, Harold Cruz had, he was ill. You know, he had just, you know, done a little bit of stuff. Though. So I'm carrying Harold Cruz on my shoulder up the stairs to the president. He's standing at the head of the stairs, Leopold Senghor, the Honorable Leopold Senghor, who was on the Founders of Negro II movement. His aide whispered in his ear, there's Monsieur Donnell Lee. I was still Donnell Lee at that time. Mm -hmm. And so I'm coming up the stairs and his, he told his aide, take the Monsieur Cruz into the reception. And he asked me, he said, Monsieur Lee, would you come with me? This is the president of the country. So we go into his library and he goes to his bookshelf and he pulls out two of my books. Don't cry, scream. And we walked away of the new world. <laughs> <laughs> and he asked me to sign the books. <laughs> okay, I said, this is one of the great writers in the world, all right? As well as the president of the country. Well, the there two there were actually two great writers in that room, but anyway. <laughs> but anyway, Hort Fuller, he was the one that put me in touch with many of these people himself. So what happened, if you if you look at 10 years, 1965, 1975, of Negro Digest Black World Magazine, and, and I was involved with the renaming of Negro Digest to Black World Magazine. I led that movement, but it was Hort Fuller's idea to name them, okay? And anyway, toward the end of his tenure at, at Johnson Publishing Company, and this is very important, people don't know this, he was fired. And the reason he was fired was because he had allowed Palestinian writers mm. to write about their position oh, in wow. Israel, okay? Wow. The Israeli community got to John H. Johnson, because what happened when he fired Hort Fuller, we set up picket lines outside Johnson Publishing Company. Now, Johnson Publishing Company had basically built a new multi-story building on Michigan Avenue in downtown Chicago. It was new, okay? We set up picket lines. Johnson came out, John H. Johnson came out and asked us to come upstairs. I was a spokesperson. <laughs> and basically I said, Mr. Johnson, Hort W. Fuller is one of us, not only us here in Chicago, but one of us nationally and internationally. We want to know why he fired him and number two, why you stop publishing Black World Magazine. Johnson was very clear. He said, the Jewish community had come to me and stated unequivocally that if you do not stop publishing Palestinian writers, we're gonna to talk to our friends and pull all of our ads out of Ebony Magazine. Wow. And this was so clear to us because he had just built the building. 
And to pull the ass out of Ebony meant the, the destruction of Ebony Magazine. That was his money cow. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so he said, I had to let Hort, Mr. He said, I always called him Mr. Fuller. I had to let Mr. Fuller go. And so Hort went back to Atlanta and we started First World Magazine. Mm -hmm. But Hort Fuller was a giant and he was a much more of a giant to me because back in the, 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 the 60s, late 60s, early 70s, especially when I was, you know, in between uh, the army and, 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 and find, trying to find my way as a young writer, I was six foot one, about 145, 50, 60 pounds at the most, looked like a walking skeleton. He would take me to dinner every week, said, at least you get one good meal a week. All right. <laughs> and, and finally, about Hort Fuller, when I got the position at Cornell University, I didn't have no money. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I couldn't even get to Cornell, okay? <laughs> so I asked him, not, this is to show you how, how, how what, what a good brother he was. I asked him, would he loan me $3,000 so I could buy a car, okay? And he didn't even, he pulled out his checkbook and said, no, you come with me. We're going to get the cash now. Got me $3,000. I bought a Volkswagen and a few clothes and, you know, some few other things. And drove to Ithaca, New York. Okay, this was Hort Fuller. He said, "Pay me back when you can," and that's what I did. This brother it was is uncommon in terms of our history. Always knew who he was. I actually saw him knock a guy down at Ebony. This was the old Ebony. Okay, mm -hmm. the guy said something to him. He held off and hit this guy and knocked him down the stairs. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so it's all. Awesome. Is all this going to be your ne your next book, or where 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 we, where can we find this stuff? Are you? you yeah, I'm gonna write about it. I'm all right. right. Okay. okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Sorry to interrupt, but we do have a few questions um, okay. from our attendees. The first is from actually a PhD student within our department, Wilbert St. Hilaire. He says, what are some ways, in your opinion, that we can revive the revolutionary spirit of African people in the United States amidst white validation and other forms of confusion? Study history. We, our people are still uh, ignorant about who they are. And if you don't know who you are, if you don't know who you are, anybody can name you. And they will, okay? That's how we end up with the names that we have, all right? That's number one. Number two, there are serious men and women in your city who are involved in serious struggle. And I'm not just saying this because Dr. Asante is there, but go to M MKA Institute. Go to the Bloxham Institute under Dr. Turner, okay? Uh, uh, listen to Word uh, Radio. Mm -hmm. uh, in, 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 in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Go to uh, Mark Lamont Hill's bookstore. What is it called? It's, uh, Uncle uh, Bobby's. Book, Uncle Bobby's bookstore. Get involved. See, one of the things that's different between us and I think the Black Lives Matters movement is that we studied every week together mm -hmm. as, as a group. And this kept us together. We pooled our resources to build these institutional structures. Okay. And we trusted each other. In fact, we had common housing and where we would pool our money in order to have an apartment here, an apartment there. In fact, we at one time, we had a whole building, about eight apartments that we occupied, that we just pooled our resources in order to stay together. And so it was that deep love and caring and understanding that if we didn't do it, it wasn't gonna get done. It just wasn't gonna get done. And we knew that what separated us from the enemy was that we knew our history. We yeah. knew that what preceded us. And so we stood on the shoulders of these great men and women. And as a result of that, we were not afraid of anything or anybody, okay? Beautiful. And we built, these, we built these institutions, okay? But Thank study you. order, you know. Uh, if you wanna say, if you, the, the, the way to, be, to defeat ignorance, read books. <laughs> That's, right. That's it, as simple as that, okay? Thank you for that. Um, the next question, based on your experience in the movement, what would you do differently? What would you suggest young activists do to help further change in the area of art and social activism? I think the one thing that I think I would do different, I would do a lot more study in the political economy and understanding capitalism a little bit more, a lot more in fact, and understanding how the world actually works Mm -hmm. under capitalism. See, one of the real problems that we had as young poets growing up 
we didn't care about poverty. We we just we, we didn't you know we used our money as it came in, and we did not have the the foresight in terms of planning and how to raise money. And 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 and, and one, well, one of the reasons, one of the things that pushed us into buying these institutional these buildings and stuff, I never forget back in the late sixties, we would meet in churches. And every time we would say anything that the minister disagreed with, he would put us out. Okay, so I said, "I got this." <laughs> I, mean, I mean, you only have to do this one or two times, and then that we bought our first property. We had two storefronts, but then we decided to buy a big, large, like almost like oversized supermarket, and split it up and make it into uh, our first headquarters that we own that we were actually paying a mortgage on. And there we had our first bookstore. We had a credit union. We had a printing uh, company. Uh, we had a food co-op. Uh, we had our first schools with uh, preschool through third grade. We bought a farm in upstate uh, Michigan, uh, New, New Haven, Michigan. We were serious about struggle. And what we wanted to move toward was a level of self-sufficiency and self-defense, you see. And so the brothers and sisters, we trained together. Brothers and sisters, we were involved in basically trying to keep these institutional structures together. And we did. And they still, to a large extent, many of them still exist today. And so I would, you know, since you learn how to make money at one point in this very, uh, 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 um, the, and the culture and the economy that we live in, which we do not control. But at the same time, we have to understand that we have to have resources. We are probably one of the few organizations that did not build our organizational structures on grants of foundation money. Everything has come from the black community, you see. Only up until recently, in terms of these charter schools, did we begin to receive money from the state and from the city. And let me just say something about that. We did not actually believe in the charter school movement. But I said, and I was backed up by my wife, is that the charter schools, these white charter schools with black fronts are coming into our community and they're using our tax money. This is our tax money. And so we should not be afraid of these charter schools as long as when we file for a charter, make sure we put in there African-centered education, which we did. And guess what? We were denied. <laughs> and then we went on the phone. So the, the, the chairman, the superintendent, Paul Vallis, he was a superintendent. Mm -hmm. I got on his case publicly, all right? I went after him publicly. I wanted to know why our charter was denied. And so when he came off the stage, I had all the brothers and sisters around this guy and say, you got three charters left. Why can't we get one of them? He did not know we were denied the charter, especially since my wife was a, 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 a consultant to the Chicago public school system, all right? And so what happened, he said, can you come see us Monday at the uh, Board of Education? So I told everybody in their mama, call this guy, call these people and let them know who we are. We got there Monday, he met us at the door and said, Dr. Lee, you know, Professor Marabuti, we good, we good. We just, just got to go in the meeting and we go, you know. So we got into the meeting, the guy who denied us, he was sitting at the end of the table, mm -hmm. I was ready to go after this guy. But he didn't say nothing. I say one word. So the superintendent said, look, we got to come out to your schools and visit them tomorrow. This is Tuesday. So we said, okay. He said, we're just going to do a 15 minute walkthrough. He got to the school. We stayed up there all that night, make sure everything was tight. He came to the schools that morning. The guy didn't leave in this group, about four or five people. They didn't leave until about three or four hours. They were astounded at what we were doing on our own with no support. We got the charter, and then we got another charter, and then they gave us another charter. I'm saying that so, so they saw that essentially we were serious about the education of our babies. All right, so they got people standing, standing in line trying to get into our schools, and so that 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 anyway, that's just one story. There are a lot more stories. So. Well, I just I, you know I just want to say thank you so much, and and the Paul Vallis story is a good way to end because he came to Philadelphia. <laughs> And, uh, and one of the first things that the community did was to meet him with a group. And uh, he, 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 he reached out to me to write the 
a required course for African American history for mm -hmm. the 11th grade. So that was one of the one of the achievements that Paul Vallis made here. But I think Chicago must have frightened it. <laughs> so, but, but, but I, I just want to ask you a question. I yeah. need to make leave. I need to ask you a question, Dr. Asante. Now, what I was dreaming about about you, you know, since I knew I was going to see you at the end of the, you know, mm -hmm. I'm saying, how does how does guy write a hundred books? You know what I'm saying? I mean, I know I, I got about thirty and so like that, you know, all that stuff. I got editors and then I write and all this. How the guy, then, I, then it hit me. I know how he did it. The guy, <laughs> the guy, the guy go to bed with a pen in one hand <laughs> and in the other hand. Okay, and he's writing twenty four seven. <laughs> <laughs> Now, the way I do it, I learn from you, actually, because because actually I, most people don't know this story, but um, but uh, you may not remember it. But I I was flying, or you were flying. We were flying somewhere together on a small plane upstate oh. New York, and you were writing, and you were flying there, right? I said to myself, "That's what you have to do. You have to use every moment, every opportunity." So that's basically what what I, I've been doing. And uh, and today today I wrote about uh, ten pages on a new book that I'm working on with one of my colleagues. But thank you so much. I'm just really this has been a joy. And we and let's just do this. We should try to do this every year. I mean, you know, this is just wonderful. I mean, because young people need to hear these stories. They don't know these stories. It's like yeah. they don't know, you know, these are, we, we, are, we are a people of great nobility. And the yeah. achievements of the African-American people against so, so many incredible obstacles. I mean, the, the achievements are phenomenal. I mean, it's like, it's awesome. I mean, you, you build an institute, you build institutions. I mean, this, nobody's giving you, you don't have inheritance of a million, uh, $10 million where you can say, okay, I got, I, I'm going to use part of my inheritance to do this. No, we do this out of our sweat and our blood. Uh, doctor, we appreciate you. We, we love you, man. I love you too. And just go to thirdworldpressfoundation.org. All right. All right. Third World Press Foundation. Third World Press Foundation. Org. All we right. Have a new, new website, Bill, but that one works now. So stay All strong. Right. All right. Thank you. All right. Really thank you. quick, before we leave, um, Dr. Hockey, can you please give our attendees um, a way that they can contact you in case they weren't able to um, like ask the question and have answer it like now? Right. They can go to uh, TW Press 3. That's T W P R E S S 3 at AOL.com. That's uh, my email. And then go to our website, which is www.thirdworldpressfoundation.org. Okay. Or I can call at 773-651-0700. And my associate is uh, Rose Perkins. Uh, and she's there all day Tuesday and a half day on Friday. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you, Jasmine. And thank you, Belinda. Thank yeah, you. thanks, Jasmine. You, you know, we did pretty good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.